I got a lathe, a uh, used lathe. It's a uh, eight millimeter Geneva style watchmaker's lathe made by Wolf John. And I paid about 300 US dollars for it, 300 Swiss francs. It's like 340 US dollars probably today. And um, Three oh nine was shipping, so it's cool. It came with this stuff, and I have it set up over on my other workbench. So I'll go there in a minute. But the, I want to explain something, which is the reason I did this is well, not the sole reason, but basically at the beginning of my channel, I bought this Patek Philippe movement. It's a sixteen two fifty, and. Um, I paid 400 Swiss francs for it. It's a movement in the dial. And I, I bought it because I was like, someday I'll find a case for it and I'll put it in that case and it'll look beautiful. The dial is fine, the hands are fine. They're not attached to the movement right now, but we'll get into all that in another video. But I found this case um, not too long ago, which is made by this company in Italy called Fope. And this is based on a Cartier design, supposedly, um, of a elliptical watch from the 70s, 60s, I'm not sure. Um, but it happens to be just the perfect size for the, the, for the Patek Philippe. So um, I think it's going to make an amazing case. I have the crystal for it. There's some... There's some, there's some structural issues with it too. For example, and these will all be fun challenges. The case was designed for the tonneau shaped or barrel shaped movements. Um, there's probably a better word for that, but this move, the 16250 is round and it's a bit bigger than the movement that was in the watch. So I have a small CNC machine and I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out exactly what that needs to be and I'm gonna open it up. And then in terms of the lathe, um, the, the stem works. It came with a stem and a crown. The crown was not a Patek Philippe crown. This crown is actually the faux pay crown that goes with the case. But the problem is the stem is too short. And, the, and, the, and it, a stem extension doesn't work because the stem extension requires this little um, part where it threads to itself. And that is actually too long to use the stem extension. It extends the crown too far out. So I started investigating buying a new stem for the 16250 and I found prices like almost $200 just for a stem because it's Patek Philippe. So I was like, well, I'm not gonna do that. I'll either make a stem or, or I'll figure out how to extend it in a more complicated way. But the more elegant thing is to make a stem, <laughs> elegant if it's successful, um, because then it'll be one contiguous piece of metal. It won't be some hacked together thing. And so that's the lathe. I thought, well, that's the way, that's how you make stems. So that's, that, that's my first objective with the lathe. Um, and this is, uh, just to give you an idea, this is a stem and an extension from the faux pay watch. I think that's, yeah, I'm not sure what crown that is. I think I was just messing around with that. Um, but here you can see the stem. And now I'm going to take it over to the bench and just show you how I have two options to make the stem. One is to make it out of raw stock and the other is potentially to find a similar stem that's bigger and then uh, turn it down, which would re require a little bit less uh, movement material removal. Um, so the other thing though, just because I'm talking about the lathe, I want to show before switching benches the, the accessories that came with it, and some of these also are accessories that I had through other sources, like um, Ed in Las Cruces gave me this ballon chuck, I think it's pronounced. This is an eight millimeter, so this works directly with the lathe. And then I had, he in that stuff he gave me, there was also this smaller ballon chuck, which works if you put it into a collette for the, the right size. So you can put this in the, this collet and then it also uh, is for even smaller 
balance. This is basically, you can put your balance wheel in here to protect it and stick the, there's a tiny hole in the tip of that you can't even see. You can stick the uh, pivot out through that hole and then you can polish your pivot while the whole balance is held securely, even, even if it has the mainspring on it or the, the hairspring. Um, what else? This is a micrometer that I already had. But basically you have all these regular collets and then you have these inverted collets which allow you to hold wheels with the... You could hold a wheel here with the pinion in it and then you could you can polish that on the lathe also by using... You put this in the end stock, that's the right side of the lathe, and then you support the... You would put the wheel here with the pinion. You stick this in the other side. You use this to support the pivot sticking out of the pinion, the, or the, the, the pinion itself. Then the pivot sticks through the back, and then you can also, that's another way that you can polish the pivot um, using the lathe, I believe. If anybody knows that that's completely wrong, please leave a comment. But it's it's kind of it's something like that. Um, what else? Uh, I bought a thimble at the flea market. Actually, a lady gave me this thimble because uh, I want to weld a pin to it, and that's like a kind of custom watchmaking tool that I saw advertised on Dave's Watch Parts as a something that people use to to release. For example, to release the stem, you can do it with one finger, poking it with a pin like this instead of holding a special tool for it. Um, this is for the tailstock, so you can push a reamer or something into some into uh, uh, something that's in a collet on the other side of the lathe. And um, yeah, so anyway, there'll be more time to get into that in the future. So now I'm going to take this over to the to the lathe and show you that. Okay, so before I sit down here, I think it's worth just kind of showing this setup in a wide angle view because once I turn on the cameras, you won't see that anymore. So this is the controller for the lathe. It has a little speed adjuster. And um, I think everything else you'll be able to see in the, this is some raw stock I ordered from China, just um, tube, tube or wire stock, whatever you want to call it. And um, to turn on the camera system, just like the, my other bench, I just push one button here and everything will start recording. Okay, so, oh, so I wanted to, first of all, in the lathe here, you can see we have a, this is just a random stem from something else. I got a, I got hundreds and hundreds of stems in a spare parts lot that I ordered a long time ago. So I have lots of different, and they're not all the same, so I have lots of different stems to pick from. And then... That in there is the stem that's of the same scale as the the Patek Philippe stem, and you can see how this one this one couldn't be modified to to match this because, and not that I'm trying to match that one anyway. I'm going to match the Patek Philippe, but you, there's lots of different stems. You can look around for ones that have material where you need it. That's my theory behind that. Okay, so the next thing is, I've never done I've never used a lathe before. I have some grabbers, gravers, that are probably not the right thing for this lathe. That's a burnisher. These were from Ed in New Mexico, and I'm going to try one of them, and it probably won't work. It's probably not sharp enough, it's too old, but it's just to get a feel for what's involved here. 
Um, let's see if I can show you that. It's not going to work. I should wear like heavy duty protective eyewear too for, before doing this. Now I'm going to be careful. It, so, so by the way, this is, I'm expecting this to be a complete fail. It's just like, it's fun for me to set up the whole lathe, get to this point. I'm, I'm still actually going to do a separate video about restoring the lathe. I haven't replaced the lubricant in it yet and cleaned it. I have the stuff for that. But the point of this video is just like, I got the lathe. I want to get my hands on it. I want to touch a graver to that stem and see what happens carefully. Now this has two directions. This is going this direction, which I think is wrong. So I can change the direction. Now it's coming towards me off the top. And you can see that's as slow as it'll go. And then you can go up to, oh, the motor's moving. It can go up to about 5,000 RPM. So I need to clamp that motor, but the motor, I put the clamp away. I don't want to do that right now. I got to do that just as a safety thing. The way this plate is seated, I thought I didn't need the clamp. I was wrong. Okay. So I also need a loop. This disaster is going to end very quickly, so if you're bored, don't worry. <laughs> this is insane. Oh, this is insane. The whole idea that this is something that people do is freaking insane. And yet, it seems doable. So... Oh, by the way, I think I have the wheels here about the same on the on the motor and the smallest wheel on the lathe. So I think that my RPMs are correct. So I'm going to start at um, 1500. And, and if somebody knows something, I'll, I'll be doing more. Having touched this and gotten started, I'll be doing more investigation of how to actually do it. Again, it's just like I'm, I'm excited to just do touch something. And then having touched it, when I start reading about it, it's going to be immensely more interesting because I'm going to be like, okay, I know, I know what I'm reading about. I've done that, and that works or that doesn't work. So I'm just going to try to take down one of these collars or whatever you want to call it on the... on the stem and I'll probably end up with a stem lodged in my forehead Jesus sorry I can't even see where I can't really see the height of anything okay I can feel contact I should be using some kind of cutting fluid or something. I have some. Oh, I see little bits coming off. That is cool. That's it, man. That's insane. First time ever using a watchmaker's lathe. I can't believe that. 
I can't believe it. That's crazy. Oh, a couple things I wanted to say. I'll, I'll, nah, I should, I'll, I'll wrap this up very quickly. But basically, when I look at all this stuff, like online, watch other demos or whatever, I, my mind is just full of questions. And that's part of why it's fun for me to do this channel. So the thing about this is that there's a collet in here, which I think is 0.9 millimeters. You can see it says, I think that that's a nine. It's either a six or a nine. But nine makes sense because the normal stem is 0.9 millimeters. So to get that collet out, first of all, to get the workpiece, that's what you call whatever you're working on. To get that out, you just loosen this. And this is screwing into the back of the collet that's inside there. And that's what tightens it. And it's also what closes the jaw on the collet. So I'm going to loosen this and pull this collet out. Now the collet has a groove in it, you can see there. And that groove is for, so that it doesn't spin freely or get too tight as a result of rotation. And then this just is inside there and pulls it all, just pulls the collet into the, uh, the chuck, collet is this, the chuck. Ugh, so embarrassing. No, this is the chuck, that is the collet. <laughs> um, this pulls the chuck in into the collet and tightens it up and then this has a hole through it so you can also poke things through that um, for different types of uh, collets so you, when you put a ch chuck into it you find the groove slide it in tighten it from behind that's it. And um, this is the tailstock I was saying. Um, there's a there's a attachment for that. You can remove this and put in that tailstock lever. This is not tight right now. Oh, so I do have one question though for the for viewers that know more about this than I do. I checked out this. I read about how to make sure a lathe is in good condition. And there's a thing about you, you check it to make sure that you got perfect alignment between the, the headstock and the tailstock. And it seems to me that this one needs adjusting. It looks good right there, but when I tighten it, hmm. maybe that's not so bad. Oh yeah, this needs to be tight also. Sorry, you're probably not interested in this, but this is all the stuff that I have to learn about. See, when I tighten it, it moves a little bit to your, moves down on the screen. So if it goes in and centers, that looks fine, right? But it's not tight yet. I'll just pull it out a little bit and I'll tighten it. Now you see, it just moves to the left. Now, if I loosen this and push it in, you see it's off center by, if that's 0.9 millimeter, it's off center by about 0.2. And it needs to move, uh, I can't remember which direction. I think it needs to move that direction. The way that this lathe stays, the, the way that this piece stays upright is that it's got a flat side here and a flat side on the bar here. And this looks adjustable to me, like you could pull this whole piece out, unscrew it, pull it out, uh, chamfer it or, or whatever you call it, like ch change its shape a little bit and put it back in. But there may be a way to do it just by, or maybe you remove a little bit of material right here. Um, off this plate so that when it when you tighten it it leans differently something like that but I'm sure there's a way to do that I'll figure that out it's a minute little adjustment I also have this theory you could just hit it with a mallet and it would kind of distort that plate to the right position but that's probably the worst way to do it 
Um, all right, so that's it. Thanks for watching. This is a hybrid mechanical quartz watch, and by hybrid I mean it has a balance wheel, but we use the electromagnetic to drive it instead of the advanced wheel. You can see the hand is moving smoothly. This is a movement that's called a Swiss sign. This I bought at the flea market a couple of weeks ago for 15 francs. And these are really interesting comparisons, and I'm going to do a separate video about that. Um, this is an ETA 20. 452, which I'm familiar with, and a really beautiful case of stainless steel and working. This is not working, I think it's a, I can't remember the movement in it, um, but I'm ordering a uh, new mainspring, I'm uh, sorry, a uh, hairspring for it, so I'll get to my exhibition. Again, this is in a beautiful case, stainless steel case. This is a early quartz watch from Oris. It has a movement in it that is super interesting. It's basically a jump forward. So there's a complicated way you set the minutes, and then when you change your time zones, you change the hours only with the crown, and it jumps from To set the minutes, I think you have to press and hold and it depends on the confidence of the one and the number. But this is interesting because this, this watch is probably one of the first uses of the uh, second motor to directly drive the air train. And that's why they, they came up with this, this idea of the jump wire. And the second motor gives you the new at the time controls, the industry new controls over what you can do with. Mechanical movements are driven by quartz technologies. And then um, this is the only one that's not in a stainless steel case, but it's a kind of cool um, wow. and I'll fix this one. It's tricky, and the other thing is it's tricky more than a manual. This is tricky in dial and even the panels on the dial. And I'll do the presentations for this. This is a stainless steel one. But um, the reason I want to mention that is that I'm still most interested in learning about individual movements and the history of the progress of the watch industry over time as technology change. And I'm interested in doing that on a low budget. So I'm excited to be able to do that before we close on this video. And all these tools I'm buying are extremely inexpensive too compared to their new counterparts, like a new ring from Bridgeon, a new quality ring, and with the accessories can send you back $34,000. So I bought my ring for $300. And um, again, it's just it's really just a learning experience for me. And um, I think it's quite a trip.